right. Thanks everyone for joining the April um, community meeting. I think it's it's been a while since we've met. I know we had Amy um, last month, um, so it's been a little while. Um, we've got a pretty full agenda, so I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to take um, just a minute to to talk about the symposium in Boston um, and hope uh, persuade you all to uh, to register and join us. Um, then we'll kick off a new partnership. Very important, uh, very exciting new partnership with the uh, uh, ICB2 Foundation and Persistent. Um, and then we'll turn it over to the ENAC Network and they'll talk about what's new. Um, yes, the sky is that blue in Boston in June in the evening. Um, but uh, it, again, our uh, symposium will be June 24th and 25th this year. Um, we decided to move it back to June. We've been doing uh, September and um, I, I think I think this year is going to be a, a really exciting year. So I will just entice you with a couple of additional um, tidbits. Um, the focus is digital twin and the, um, the future of AI and clinical research. Um, no surprise, those are big topics um, that um, you, you see a lot. We've got a, a really exciting first day. We've got um, a keynote by um, Robbie uh, Goldstein from the, he's the commissioner of um, the Mass uh, Department of Public Health. Um, and he's gonna talk about um, the importance of using a network to support um, you know, the work they're doing. Very, very exciting. There'll also be a, a panel following um, Robbie. Um, I think that's gonna be a very big draw um, to, the, to the, the conference. And then of course we have um, Zach Kohani and uh, Chris White, who is a managing director at Microsoft, talking about um, AI. And it's, it's really looking at, it's bringing industry and academia together. So I know the two of them will be um, pretty exciting. Following them will be, I'll just move to, following them will be a um, expert panel, a large language uh, model panel, We've got three experts in different domains that um, I think are gonna be very exciting. Um, Sean will talk about our digital twin journey um, and where we're going. We've got a number of hospitals that are starting to implement um, computed phenotypes to support digital twins. So a lot of excitement there. Um, we'll bring the ENACT folks back. Um, uh, uh, Missouri, Mosa, uh, Abu Mosa will talk about um, Snowflake um, and, and their implementation. They've, they've been at it for a couple of years. Pretty exciting. And then the second day will be more of a technical day. So um, definitely I will put the, the registration link in the, um, the chat in a few minutes. And um, definitely I hope you can join us for that. It's going to be, I think, pretty, pretty exciting. Now, very ex another exciting piece of, of news, and I'm not I'm not going to spend spend a lot of time on this because I'm going to turn the um, this over to our folks at Persistent um, to give a few minutes um, overview of, of what they're doing. But we have a, a a wonderful new partnership. We've been working with them for years. They'll mention that um, they know a lot about ITB2. They've been supporting the the uh, hospitals in the global south um, for a while, um, and. Uh, there'll be more information coming out about this, but just to the, let the folks know, for those of you who um, use our ITB2 install um, Google um, group to, um, to, to send technical questions, it's now going to be monitored by the experts at Persistent who will, um, who will respond to you and, and help you through some of your you know, initial tier one um, technical um, uh, questions. So I'm, um, I'm really anticipating that this is going to really be a, a great support to the community. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Saiga, who will share her screen and talk a little bit more about Persistent. Thank you, Diane. Excited to be here. My name is Sagarika Ramana and I go by Saga. I am a client partner at Persistent Systems um, and I am based out of our New Jersey offices. Really excited to be here and um, partner with um, I2B2 on this initiative and um, for Persistent to be, um, you know, part of, um, you know, be the support partner for I2B2. So excited to get to know all of you and work with, um, um, you know, some of you in the coming months and excited for the symposium um, as well. A number of folks, uh, my colleagues are on the, um, um, on this meeting as well. So I'd like to get them introduced while I try to get my slides up. 
Um, I'll turn it over to Santosh and um, Pallavi, and um, maybe you could just pass the 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 mic on or the for introductions. I can't really see who's on while I'm sharing. So Santosh, over to you. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, and uh, everyone. So my name is Santosh Dixit. Uh, I'm the clinical pharmacologist domain expert on on the persistent team. Uh, I represent Innovation Labs, which is our in-house R and D unit. Uh, been in the U.S. healthcare space for a long time. Currently, I operate out of India. Uh, I have been supporting uh, I2B2 for last three years, been interacting with Sean uh, significantly. Uh, in the last one year, I have sort of refocused my attention towards generative AI applications in uh, different uh, aspects of medicine. And uh, this is what we will bring to the table uh, as part of our further interactions with I2B2. Uh, very excited to be here, uh, and thanks, Agarika, and thanks, uh, I2B2, uh, for the opportunity. Over to you, Pallavi. Thank you, Santosh. Hi, my name is uh, Pallavi Bhalera. I am uh, based out of uh, Pune, India, and I am the delivery partner for from persistent side, basically on the delivery side, as I mentioned, for I2B2 uh, you know, uh, project. So as part of this, uh, my uh, you know delivery team will be working closely with the I2B2 community group and will be helping you know uh, uh, provide the official support. Now that we are kind of entering into the official partner status, we'll be here to help uh, the I2B2 community with all your you know uh, support uh, support that you need from us. At the same time, definitely we are all excited to be part of this group. Uh, this status really also brings in that confidence that and we have been working with i2b2 for a while now i have my team here aditya and uh, vaibhav if you can also please come on you know quickly on camera and introduce yourself Thank yeah you all. sure yeah. Uh, hi everyone i'm aditya vidav uh, i'm working as a lead software engineer in persistent uh, i'm from pune and I'm actively working on I2B2 with Dr. Kavi from past three years. Uh, so my responsibility started from developing the I2B2 models and uh, deployment, then supporting the I2B2 and maintenance of I2B2 at the institutions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Aditya. Vaibhav? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I team, good morning. So my name is Vaibhav Tara, and I'm working with I2B2 since one year. So now, uh, like I'm here to help, uh, like to support the all the I two B two queries. So that is L one support. Yeah, and uh, uh, happy happy to work with you. So thank you. Thanks, Weibo. Over to you, Diane. Thank also. you. Thanks, Pallavi. Is anyone else on from our side? Okay. No. Perfect. No. We are yeah. All right. Let me make sure I can. Share my screen here. Are you able to see my slide? So, yes, Agarika. Okay, yes. perfect. All right, sounds good. So, I just wanted to give you a quick overview on um, persistent. You know who we are as an organization. Um, as um, you know, we are. Um, Persistent Systems is based out of um, Pune or headquartered out of Pune, which is this little dot that you see on here, about 70 miles. For those of you who are not exactly sure where Pune is, about 70 miles or so, give or take, from um, Mumbai. Um, we are, of course, a, a global organization and present, as you can see, across 21 countries. We are over 23,000 now strong um, in terms of um, size and market capitalization over about six and a half um, billion dollars. And um, from a revenue standpoint, um, the organization, so at Persistent, we crossed over a billion dollars in revenue um, the early part of um, 2023, which was um, you know, significant milestone for the, uh, the company. Uh, we are organized by, um, in terms of our focus, in terms of industry verticals, you know, we've, we are focused on banking and financial services. We work um, in healthcare and life sciences, and we also work with software and the high-tech industry primarily. So that's really our vertical focus, if you could, um, you know, want to call it that. And then you can, of course, see um, we are partnered, you know, sort of our greater partner ecosystem there, which I will talk about um, in just a little bit. Um, 
Moving on to our um, relationship, you know, Diane mentioned um, a little bit, we're very excited about this partnership with both I2B2 and Mass General Brigham. Um, Persistent has been, you know, we've, we've been partners for over six years and we have um, worked closely with both organizations, um, you know, and had a number of joint um, innovation projects and collaborations. We continue to support I2B2, um, um, you know, in, in support capacity. We also work with um, Herald Health, um, which is care alerts on the um, Mass General Brigham side of the house as well. So again, a partnership that we're very proud of and um, you know, continue to, to support. And we're really looking forward to this collaboration um, with I2B2 and the extended network as well. Um, we're excited about the June um, symposium event as well, where we'll have an opportunity to, to meet a lot of people in person. Um, so we're um, the team that you see on here. We're all part of the um, healthcare and life sciences practice. Um, we work closely with what we call our industry horizontal partners, so experts in in their field. And as you can see, we have a whole digital transformation um, and strategy consulting business. Um, our roots at Persistent are really stem from product engineering. So anything that you want a product built from the ground up or um, engineering an existing product and augmenting that um, as well as applications, that's really um, you know, sort of where the company's growth has come from and, and you know traditionally, and that's really what we bring you know experts to um, in, in the field. Um, data and analytics, again, you know, all of you on the on this um, call and meeting probably are all um, you know involved in one some capacity or the other, and that is a big part of what we do at Persistent. We are working with a number of our health systems um, customers with um, in terms of their business intelligence, data and analytics, optimizing and, um, you know, getting the data where it needs to be in the right, um, you know, format, right place at the right time, um, you know, cutting through those silos. So we bring those experts from our data practice um, um, to bear. Cloud infrastructure security, as you can imagine, you know the uh, the future is is the cloud, and you know most organizations um, are looking at a hybrid cloud strategy. If not already, have transitioned to cloud. So we have um, we do a lot of work with our health system partners um, around infrastructure and cybersecurity, of course, um, as well. And last but not the least, we bring together. Um, our intelligent automation and integration um, folks as well. They bring those resources to bear. We're doing a lot of work with health system partners on um, low code, no code platforms um, via sort of automation as well. So we support our customers uh, through a number of uh, different technologies um, as um, you know, that are part of the automation um, ecosystem. Um, just a quick note that we are, you know, premium or top tier partner across all of our hyperscalers that you can see on here. So we um, really uh, partner closely and we can bring resources uh, to bear along with these partners as well as expertise. Um, we really boast of, uh, you know, the whole, a whole host of um, certified professionals in these technologies, which, you know, is unlike most other organizations. A quick snapshot of our healthcare and life sciences um, business specifically, um, you know, we work across the segment. So uh, payer, provider, pharma, CRO, as well as um, um, med tech and devices. Um, we work with most of the top um, um, organizations, the hospitals, payers, providers, pharma. Um, they are our um, clients in this space. And we also bring an extended ecosystem of healthcare and life sciences specific partners like Pivot and um, APN and UiPath, et cetera, um, uh, to support uh, what we do for our customers in this space. Um, I will, you know, we we are focused on technology and I think, um, you know, you can't get to be in a meeting these days without the words generative AI. So I will turn it over to my colleague Santosh to kind of talk about what we are doing and our point of view in this space. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Sagarika. And again, uh, uh, very excited to be part of this group. Uh, as a uh, service provider organization, Persistent also has put a lot of emphasis on innovations in this particular uh, dynamic field of healthcare life sciences. Uh, about a year ago, when the generative AI story was just sort of uh, getting mature, uh, we created a center of excellence within our own organization. Uh, I was lucky to be part of that center of excellence group. And we focused on creating accelerators with uh, the then available generative AI technology solutions uh, to solve some problems uh, which are very, very near and dear to the uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, so one area we identified definitely was precision medicine, knowing how the, the entire field is moving towards uh, precision medicine. Uh, as part of the center of excellence, we looked at vertical problems, but we also tried to develop uh, horizontal relationships with a lot of hyperscalers. Uh, glad to mention that now we are privileged partners to all three hyperscalers, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, as well as AWS, uh, when it comes to generative AI solutions. So as part of this relationship, we get pre-market access to their, their generative AI solutions. Uh, we can test them out, we can build accelerators, and we can make them customer ready. In addition to that, our engineers and our data scientists are also contributing to developing uh, the solutions for these hyperscalers. So it is a fruitful bi-directional relationship. Now using these solutions from a few of the hyperscalers, we have created uh, a representative uh, console for precision medicine. As you can see on the screen, uh, this is a full-fledged demo. For lack of time, we will not go into this detail today, but most likely in the June meeting, we will try to present our viewpoint on how generative AI can improve the precision medicine pathways. Uh, what we have done here, we have taken a combination of large multimodal models and large language models together to solve various uh, problems in the area of, let's say, radiology image reporting, pathology image reporting, uh, creation of medical reports, uh, health health insurance claims intelligence. Uh, these are very uh, important problems to the entire uh, diagnostic industry. And furthermore, when you know that you have established a disease, how do you treat this patient? Uh, by looking at the current medical literature and also practicing an evidence-based medicine approach uh, using knowledge graphs, uh, generative AI knowledge graphs, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is a demo that we have created. We are getting very good traction in the provider industry as well as payer industry. With this demo, uh, we have been able to generate some, uh, some uh, commercial opportunities for us with this kind of a demo. But we go, we continue to go deep into this kind of application with the latest release of, let's say, Gemini Pro, which was released last week by Google. And we are trying to explore this space uh, more and more uh, with the with the help of a lot of partners, uh, uh, such as the ones on the call right now. Uh, we would love to keep talking about this. Uh, this is what Persistent can bring to the table. I recently was in Boston. I met uh, Sean and Kavi and few others. And we already have some plans to, to explore some R&D opportunities on the platform of I2B2 uh, with this kind of generative AI approach for computer phenotype or digital twins, as we talked about. Uh, so this is just a snapshot. Uh, Sagarika, you can go to the next slide, please. And Tantosh, I'm, I'm going to, um, just because of uh, just thinking about time, sure. I'm gonna jump into the next agenda. I think what we want to do here is um, get you on the agenda for the June meeting and get you on to the second day so we can go into this a little bit more detail. Okay, uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, all I want to mention in this slide is that we are not only focused on uh, healthcare as such, but we believe that healthcare is now also being influenced by life sciences, significantly genomics and uh, all supporting pathology uh, and biological medicine. Uh, as a company, we are also deeply invested in the biology space, uh, which is the core engine for clinical medicine. And again, maybe in the June conference, we'll talk a little bit about our other innovations, et cetera. Uh, long story short, Persistent is very excited to be part of this journey, not only as a technical service provider, but as a core innovator when it comes to healthcare and life sciences. And uh, I'll be very happy to interact with uh, all of you uh, online or in person, hopefully in June. Uh, back to you, Sagarika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane. Um, I think we'll we'll pause here and then we could certainly uh, circle back. You could reach out to any one of us on this call from Persistent and we're happy to answer questions or communicate. Thank you. Thank you very much.
All right. I think this is going to be a great partnership. I'm very excited. Um, all right. So onward in act. I think uh, who's going to kick this off, Joe? Great. I'll pick it off while Joe is um, getting into presentation mode here. So my name's Elena Sendrogano. I am the National Project Manager for NACT. I see a lot of familiar names on the line, so I know I've been working with many of you over the years uh, from, the from the beginning with the ACT Network. So for today, next slide, please. We are going to just go through a bit of a refresh. So what are the goals of ENACT? We are ending year two of the ENACT grant. So I know we've been part of the annual symposiums for I2B2 Transmart, but for anyone new on the line, just want to go through a bit of a refresh on uh, what it is we do and uh, introductions of our support team. Then we'll go through some current capabilities of the network and have a live demo. Thank you, Philip and uh, some of the near-term functionality, and then talk a little bit about where you can learn more about Enact. But before we get too deep into that, just a, a quick thank you for those of you on the line who have participated with ACT so quickly. We have over 50 CTSAs who participated in standing up the, the ACT network, and that meant over 100 million unique patients, uh, over a million queryable data elements. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, fire compatibility, expanded data elements, and a variety of plugins and more to come to uh, continue enhancing capabilities of the network. Next slide. So for an act, we're building upon all of the great work everyone accomplished with the five years of building the ACT network. So an act grows the power of the network and its community. So I'll quickly run through the four aims here. So creating a user-friendly collaborative research and computing environment with uh, better availability of cutting edge analytical methods. So a lot of these are in place. You'll hear a little bit later from Jeff on data quality. Aim to creating a platform that provides statistical machine learning capacity to scientists and their teams. So these are our ephemeral data enclaves, and that's pilot being piloted right now with the limited data sets. You'll hear uh, more about those from Michelle. And then AIM-3, which will start in year three, beginning in June. So leveraging informatics tools and health record data to enable clinicians to generate evidence that can be applied to improve patient care. So this is going to be really exciting for the network. So basically patients like mine. So we'll have more to talk about this in the future as we kick off this work this summer. And then AIM-4, so our dissemination component, which is woven throughout the entire five year of the grant and the dissemination team is leveraging the i and NCATS program to help design the network for sustainability and what happens beyond the grant period. So I will pause here, um, Joe, if you don't mind stopping sharing, just so we can do quick introductions. So like I said, my name's Elena Sandrogano, project manager for uh, for the network, and I want to turn it over to, let's start with the Harvard Shrine team for some quick intros there. Sure. Mark, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much, Elena. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Mark Cerriello. I'm a senior project manager here at Harvard Catalyst. Harvard Catalyst is uh, Harvard's sort of CTSA organization and um, the home of the Shrine software, which you will see that's, uh, that powers the uh, network in addition to I2B2. And I'll turn over for quick introductions to Doug, Drew, and then Philip, who also work with me on uh, network operations for ENACT. Uh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Doug McFadden. I've been with Harvard Catalyst since its beginning and been overseeing informatics. And uh, Shrine has been a key project for us all along. So very excited to be giving, well, not me, Philip, giving the demo. Uh, uh, I'm going to hand it off to Drew. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Drew Hendricks. I am support, application support engineer here at Harvard Catalyst uh, with, the, with the NetOps team. Um, my main duties is helping sites uh, onboard into the ENACT network and, and the ongoing support going forward. So i um, been here for almost four years in June, and uh, time flies by when you're having fun. So on to you, Philip. Uh, hi, I'm Philip, uh, also part of Catalyst and part of the Enact Network Operations Group, uh, helping sites troubleshoot as needed, uh, various issues, and uh, supporting kind of monitoring, making sure network performance is uh, working as we want it to. Uh, and I'm passing back to Elena, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. So, Jeff, how about you introduce yourself? 
Hi. Okay. <clears throat> I'm Jeff Klein. I'm a faculty at Mass General Brigham. I've been working with I2B2 for about a decade. I am leading the data quality working group in the ENACT network. Thanks, Jeff. And then Michelle and Joe. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm at the Pit, and I primarily work on the ontology and several other working groups like data harm and um, NLP and data quality. Joe? And my name is Joe Heidel. I'm a senior advisor at the consulting firm Chartis uh, with Elena, and I assist with project management work and building out some of our communications capabilities with an act. Thank you, Joe. All right, so we'll get back in to our deck here and pass it over to Philip. All right, thanks, Elena. And so uh, I guess in terms of current use cases, um, ACT and now ENACT Network support kind of three basic use cases, uh, clinical trial, feasibility and design, clinical trial recruitment, and population research. Um, to start with the ways that uh, the network has supported clinical trials, um, I want to just start with a real-world example. So this is a study where the ENACT network was part of how, was part of the process of supporting the clinical trials design phase. Um, you know, this is focused on osteoarthritis, of the knee and managing long-term pain in a way that reduces uh, reliance on opioids, which is obviously very important. Um, the The network was used to kind of make sure that there was like a large patient set that could be uh, identified and to refine that for putting forth an actual clinical trial. And we can go to the next slide. Um, this is that actual clinical trial. At that point, you know, there's significantly more criteria and this includes kind of a screenshot of some of those criteria as well as a link to the actual trial. And I'm gonna take over uh, sharing now so I can then demo what some of this uh, would actually look like. So I'm going to log in, uh, if I can here. Uh, sorry, let me just retype this. Okay. And I'm not sure what's going on there, so I'm going to just refresh it. Sorry about that. This is our demo node. And when we first log in, we see a few pop tutorial pop ups that just highlight kind of the basics of, uh, you know, how the tool works. On the left, we can see our medical concept list. Uh, this is essentially where we find terms to build on our query. In the center, this is the panels where we drag terms in order to construct uh, the queries and questions we'd want to run, uh, followed by uh, areas within those panels to sort of further refine uh, parameters for, for concepts. And then once we've developed the query we want, we want to run, uh, we would you know, name it, we could potentially add in demographic distributions if we wanted to see that, and then you know, run the query. Now to start with the example that we were touching on to do basic uh, feasibility, we would look for osteoarthritis. I'm going to go on and filter that to ICD-10 diagnoses, just drag over the full folder for that. Um, and then clear that out. We would also want to limit this to adults. So I will drag over adult age patients. We're looking for patients with osteoarthritis of the knee who are adults. Uh, we want to exclude just doing a basic kind of high level feasibility. So changing that from with to without since we want to exclude it. And we also want to exclude uh, patients who have had um, who've had knee replacement surgery. So I'm just entering the code there and I'm gonna drag over uh, that code as well to the exclusion panel. We will go on and enter here, uh, CT feasibility. 
and we're doing actual feasibility and we'll run that as you can see uh there we go we're starting to have results already coming in live um now to do real feasibility we'd probably refine this and run several more queries i'm just going to jump back to edit these criteria and by adding in a few more terms that are exclusion criteria from the actual clinical trial um, to kind of show part of that process um, as we kind of drill down to get an actual cohort. Some of the things that are included in the actual clinical criteria exclusion is just, um, oops, let me make it filtered by ICD-10, things like excluding hearing loss and uh, and vision to basically limit the uh, the cohort to patients who would be able to successfully uh, let's go low vision successfully follow the you know follow all the procedures that are part of the part of the clinical trial. So I'm going to go on and exclude those. There are also several um, medical conditions that were excluded in this, such as poorly managed diabetes. So I'm going to pull over some of these. Um, and I've got these terms already typed out. I am apologies moving somewhat fast because of the uh, brevity of this, but um, you know, these are examples of the terms that that would be sort of more fully uh, fleshed out to really do a full recruitment. Also, um, this trial specified to exclude any active substance abuse. So I'm gonna go on and uh, search for substance abuse. Uh, oh, and I need to spell that correctly. Um, so we have a few terms here. I actually wanna see what's in this full folder um, because I think that's the level of, of sort of broad category that we want. So I'm gonna navigate using the browse to get to that broader folder of uh, disorders due to substance abuse. And you know, we can see this covers many more of the specific substance abuse than just what we found in search. So I'm gonna drag over this full folder. Um, as I do that, I'm realizing that because we're, we wanted to exclude active substance abuse, I wanna separate this out uh, so that we can date limit it to only recent substance abuse. So I'm gonna do that here. We'll go back six months. So this essentially, instead of just having it as a broad exclusion, really excluding just patients within the last six months. So again, while this would really involve more refinement, if we were doing, you know, really drilling to identify the cohort, this is an example of the additional criteria that might get pulled in uh, as part of that work. We're looking again for patients with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee who are adults and having several more exclusion criteria in general, as well as some that are time uh, constrained specifically. Um, we can then, we might rename this to recruitment and run this trial, run this query rather. And again, we can start to see uh, results populate and those will come in and appear live as sites return. Now the third use case for um, ENACT currently is to support population research. I'm gonna go ahead and clear this, show an example of some of the kinds of research we can do um, at kind of a population and counts level. One of the areas where I think there's really a lot we can discover is just in COVID. Um, we can look at obviously just general cases of COVID. We can also then um, break that down by uh, things like multiple instances of COVID. Uh, oops, any, I'm gonna include the labs. These are actually terms that leverage multiple different uh, lab positive tests at institutions. So it gets us a little broader um, set of patients who have had COVID. Um, but this might be a good just starting with a COVID, um, you know, COVID population towards then looking at comorbidities, prevalence of severity. And I might actually limit this to uh, patients in 2020 who had COVID as a way to just limit it also to patients who we know uh, did not get 
vaccinated for that. Um, I'm also highlighting what is currently a more experimental feature within Shrine. Um, this is a map that populates as sites return with responses so that we can see um, kind of a, a, a view of how many patients across the country are being represented and reflected in the ENACT network. Um, as sites return, you'll see the circles um, continue to populate. This also reflects the size of the population at different sites, and we can go on and click and uh, see the different populations at different sites um, by doing this. Now I'm going to go on and minimize this, and we can also see that those counts are reflected here per site. And I think that is going to cover kind of a very high level what we can do as a start with this kind of thing in population research. Um, Joe, if you want to bring back the slides, we could then dig into, as I mentioned, you know, different comorbidities, uh, looking at different severity over time, different uh, side effects or, or, you know, conditions that might arise for people who had two to three different, you know, instances of COVID or had had COVID multiple times. And these counts here just show a few of the different kind of high level counts we have on the network um, of patients with COVID. So with that, I'm gonna pass to Drew, who uh, can cover some of what is happening at network operations uh, and how we support the network overall. Yes, hey everyone. So uh, with, so in network operations, um, part of our duties is to um, assist sites with onboarding and also the continued support uh, uh, through the ENACT network. Um, currently, we have 52 sites that are connected to the ENACT network. Uh, we complete weekly smoke tests um, and also quarterly uh, visualizations of site performance. Um, and we also, there's the uh, ACT Tech distribution mailing list where this is a, uh, it's an email distribution list um, where technical resources, you know, uh, across the entire network um, with all with all institutions included can have, uh, you know, general support questions. And this is more of a collaborative effort to where, you know, some sites may have a, an issue with SSO or setup or anything of that sort, and they may uh, reach out to an institution that's part of the network and they may be able to help assist with also uh, a collaborative effort that you know we also encourage as well um next slide please okay so um right now our weekly smoke test consists of 14 queries uh as you see queries one through nine um are to confirm data availability um query 10 is more tied to uh data refreshes so here we can say okay um, you know, what was the latest data refresh within the last six months? And we can actually find out which sites have had data refreshes within any uh any allotted time frame um, within the query. Also, uh queries 11 and 13 um in the example are ontology checks. So we do ontology updates uh annually, and um, you know, we also want to make sure that that most sites are up to date with their ontology. And um also too, we have com complex queries, you know, uh, queries that you know, a little bit more heavy on the network with breakdowns or temporal queries. Um, and we also checked, so we would check the performance of, of those queries on, uh, on the network. The um, the smoke test for, is sent out weekly. Um, this is a spreadsheet for, that includes all of the results for these 14 queries for all sites. And um, yeah, this, they're sent out weekly and uh, on Tuesdays for the most part. So um, yeah, so next slide. Um, and Philip. So then, yeah, so then thank you, Drew. And yeah, then what we also do to kind of help sites with performance and identify any issues and apologies, this is a very kind of busy slide, but uh, we create these visualization dashboards based on uh, that we distribute each quarter to each site on the network to kind of highlight their overall performance, which is the upper left part, how many queries per week of the test queries are successful, are errors, um, et cetera. Uh, we provide in the bottom left a kind of what the top 20 sites on the network are looking like. So they have a comparator for how they're doing and kind of a, a general understanding. And then a more detailed breakdown on the right that really shows for each test query, we, 
test query we were we run, uh, what queries were successful, failed, uh, didn't have data where we would have expected it. So for example, um, we can see query number 10 here is the recent data query that, that Drew mentioned, where we see a few blips of gray at a few different points that would highlight that a site uh, was a little behind on their data refreshes. We can then, you know, reach out to that site, identify that to make sure that's back up and running, and uh, you know, they're back on 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 time again with those. Um, but yeah, this allows us to identify various issues at sites that are either domain specific uh, functionality. Sometimes a site will, you know, go down, and we'll be able to check in with them and see if we can offer additional assistance. Um, so this has been a great way to kind of support sites uh, in understanding their issues, troubleshooting, and improving overall net network performance. And I think that is all for this slide. So I, I'll pass on to, I'm not sure who, uh, to Jeff for some upcoming functionality. All right, let's, let's talk about data quality for like two or three minutes. Um, yeah, so... So, you know, there is a lot going on in our data quality group. And what we're doing right now is <laughs> honing this technique that we came up with some years ago that we can, you know, we can query individual things in our shrine system. But what if we had counts of everything at every site? So we knew there are actually 660 some thousand items in the Enact ontology, including all the folders and, and leaf nodes. And if we could count the number of patients that had all of those things, we could do some interesting data quality. W one thing that we're focused on right now is, is comparing yeah, one, one, person, one site administrator to compare the data at their site to data at other sites and see how their data are different. And in some cases that might just inform the site about local differences in their data. And in some cases, it might highlight errors, like, oh, we don't have, we have 1% of patients who are diabetic, but I think we should have more than that because most of the network has a much higher percentage. So this is our, uh, this is our workflow. Uh, sites can run this program that counts everything, and it does it very fast now. At Mass General Brigham, we can count everything on 4 million patients in about three hours. It outputs a report, it obfuscates it, so there's no identifiable uh, patient information in there. Uh, sites can choose to share that with our secure um, SFTP repository at the Enact Hub, at which point we take it and we average it with all of the other sites' data and we create a network statistics file, which we feel is a fairly safe thing to share, um, not on, on the open internet, but it's, it's something that doesn't have you know, site-specific information in it at all anymore. It's just a snapshot of the network, which is a valuable resource because it tells us what the average US healthcare looks like. Um, and then we build tools on top of that, that allow uh, users to, um, uh, to, to log into our web tool, uh, load their local data, which doesn't you know, ever come through the internet, load their local data, their local reports into our tools, and then that gets meshed with the network statistics for a bunch of very interesting tools that we are we are working on developing. And um, yeah, go to, you can go to the next slide. I'm just gonna give, a, uh, no, so this is my summary slide, but this kind of just summarizes that we're building these new tools. So let's skip to the next slide. Um, th this is a screenshot that does not do this amazing piece of work justice. This is the data quality explorer. It lets you visualize the ontology tree as a set of nodes and edges. And you can see that the, the nodes in here are different colors. And you can see some of them are gray with different colored outlines. And the outlines means there are outliers somewhere in the tree. So at this site, there are, let's see, the outlier and have some kind of outlier in the subtree. There, there are nodes in the subtree that have um, a percentage of patients that are uh, two standard deviations higher or lower than the average in the network. So it's something that might provide some information. Maybe it's a data quality issue. Maybe it's uh, an interesting difference in the site. And then you can navigate into this. And as you get into the uh, real outliers, they are different color nodes highlighting that this is actually different than 
average in the network and then a pop-up appears that tells you information about the site statistics and how your site compares to the site statistics. So this is a very powerful tool. Um, if you come to our webinar, our data quality webinar next Monday, I think uh, Joe or Elena will talk about at the end of this presentation that we're going to go into great detail on this, including a demo that um, will make this uh, really highlight the features that it has. But let's go to the next slide. And th there's also, this is, this is just another snippet of the tool. There's a table view, so you can view all this as a table if you don't like the graphical nodes and edges, and you can set up filters to just look at the nodes of interest for the data quality issue that you're honing in on. All right, next slide. Um, there are other tools that we are also working on. These are prototypes of tools to do various things. Just very briefly, top left, this is looking at trends across refreshes. So when you refresh your data, you don't delete old data, so you'd expect there to be more patients. Uh, maybe the same number, but probably more patients as time goes on. And so you can just look at this quick snapshot and see if as time goes on, do the number of patients increase? In this case, they do, so that checks out. But if it were to drop, maybe there's a problem with the data loading at that site. On the right, uh, you can see very high level missingness. Uh, our which ontologies have no data uh, at these various sites. So you can see like site C has no ICD-10 procedures. And you know, I, we talked to site C about this. And in fact, they don't load ICD-10 procedures. They don't have that in their source data. So again, these aren't always data quality issues, but they're important data questions that need to be examined. And the bottom has to do with looking at the different data mappings between sites. Um, so uh, next slide, or maybe that's my last slide. Yeah, so I'll pass it on to whoever is next. Uh, so I guess it's my turn. Um, so the one of the other upcoming features that we're really excited about is enabling the ENACT network for research. Um, um, one of the ways that we started on this process is we tried to make the ENACT network um, CDM agnostic so that we'll be able to support queries across all of the common data models, including I2B2, OMOP, and PCORI with our tools and ontologies. Um, our hope there is that we can reduce the burden on informatics teams by allowing the sites to focus on maintaining and improving the quality of their CDM of choice instead of trying to keep up with all uh, models for various projects. So to date, we do have an Enact ontology for I2B2, um, and our friends at GPC have one for PCORI. And just like Jeff said, our second step was to to be able to use the network for research, we need to be able to improve the quality of the data. Um, so Jeff and his team have been building out tools to, um, with minimal effort, allow enable the teams at the sites to review and troubleshoot their CDM quality. And so um, once we get that out, we should be ready to enable research. And we wanna enable research at three levels. Philip touched on the first level, which is the desktop level. And we also want to do federated and ephemeral enclaves, which we're really getting excited about. So for the desktop level, we hope that using Shrine queries, our new breakdown reports, and some of the new web tools that we will have available on the NAC website, that you will be able to um, do prep to research things uh, for grant proposals like NIH enrollment and table one prep preparatory queries, also being able to prepare for conferences or look to test different hypotheses. We think that the desktop environment that Shrine is going to provide will be great for that type of work. The second level of work that we've been using um, is the federated level. And in this level, we it's more like what we've done in 4CE networks and the Odyssey network. The data still resides at your site and people distribute our Python or SQL code that you run locally at the site. And then those results are aggregated for, um, you know, papers. Um, and then the work that we used, this type of federated, work on is uh, the loyalty score work that we did with Jeff. And we're currently working on a project with Hossein 
uh, past project. And we're also probably going to use this, the federated format for uh, NLP work group work. And the last type of uh, research we want to do is when you, when a researcher requires line level data, we will provide secure ephemeral enclaves. Next slide. The enacted ephemeral enclaves are secure project-based cloud analytic environments. These enclaves will initially be outfitted with well-known analytic tools like Jupyter Notebooks, R, and Python. We're trying to create a framework that is traceable, cost-effective, and highly configurable. The PIs and the governance work group are working on the regulatory framework to make this as painless as possible. The UCSD team has been working towards setting up the enclave environments. And of course, the I2B2 and Harvard Catalyst teams have really worked hard at building software features to automate the process. Um, this diagram shows the workflow moving from a shrine query to the local ENAC sites and then on to the uh, enact ephemeral enclaves for collaborative analysis. Each secure enclave will be a project-based enclave and accessible only to the named researchers on the project and will be archived at the end of the project. So it'll be a little different than like uh, N3C where your data kind of stays in there and people play with it for a long time. This will be uh, very short-lived. Um, the process will start with a Shrine query. Uh, we will use Shrine and I2B2 unique query IDs to track the cohorts in the data sets. And the I2B2 1.8 that's coming out next month will add a great configurable and traceable feature to allow users to request data sets and the admins to export those data sets. By default, the I2B2 admins will be able to export domains like domain dem dem demographics, diagnosis and medications to a secure location locally. And then with the proper um, regulatory approval, this line level data can move into the enclaves. Um, I'm hoping that this summer, I will also provide additional export formats like X OMOP and PCORI and I2B2 harmonized to our enact ontology. So this will allow um, all types of projects to be executed in the enclaves. Um, and we're hoping that this environment that the I2B2 team has created will be also useful for local data provisioning at the sites. Um, next slide. And then this is just a list of uh, some of the pilot projects that are being uh, worked on in the enclaves right now, uh, characterizing the annual incidents of postpartum hemorrhage, validating a CKD model, and some causal inference in the medical records. So these, um, so people have started playing around with um, some test data in the enclaves just to kind of prove the process works. That's it for me. Okay, we are almost done. Thank you for everyone that's uh, been patiently paying attention for the past 58 <laughs> minutes. Uh, we just have a couple more updates on what's coming next for Enact to share with you. Uh, for starters, uh, Enact has a new website that's rolling out, uh, I think this week. Uh, actually, I'll share a link in the chat after, uh, after I'm done sharing these slides, but it's a new website where we will be sharing updates, um, new capabilities of Enact, as well as upcoming webinars we have and upcoming conferences where we'll be presenting our progress at. So we, there'll be a one-stop shop for information on what's new with Enact. And also we'll be uh, hosting some of the data quality and visual visualization tools like the data quality explorer that Jeff mentioned earlier in this presentation. And then lastly, so uh, we've mentioned that we do monthly webinars or informatics teams to highlight the work that's being done to build out an act by the central team and in partnerships with a, a lot of our partner sites. So next Monday, uh, April 22nd at 3 p.m., we'll be doing a deep dive on the data quality work that Jeff and his team have been doing. And then in May, we'll be previewing some of the limited data set enclave work, some of which Michelle 
uh, just uh, spoke on, we'll be previewing some of the work that's been done there. And in addition, the at the upcoming I2B2 Transmart Symposium that Diane mentioned at the beginning of the call, and Act will have uh, some sessions to, again, to expand on some of the work that we've been doing. And if you have any questions and want more information, you can reach out via email to either myself or my colleague, Elena. And with that, that's a wrap on our presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the, the great presentation. And um, thanks for getting it all done in, <laughs> in the amount of time that you had left. Any, any questions for the, the group? I don't see any. All right. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to just say thank you to everyone and hope to see you uh, hope to see you all in June.